Lucci from the University of Warwick. And uh, as many of you know, this senior series started by now two years ago, thanks to the initiative of uh, Jan Drezinski and of Daniel. And it's therefore a particular pleasure to have Daniel as a speaker today. Um, the title of today's talk is Random Loop Models uh, and the Universal Behavior in Dimension um, 3 Plus. And as usual, the seminar will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. And having said that, Daniel, we're very much looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much. So it's really a pleasure for me to, to be speaking uh, today. And indeed, somebody pointed out that this is the beginning of season three of the seminar. So it's pleasant and we have a fantastic organization team now. So, so it's great that this series continues. So I'd like to discuss indeed random loop models in dimensions three and higher. And it's been a collaboration over many years with many people. So, so they are listed here. I mean. The, the main collaborators for, for different projects, uh, Gondolfo, Ruiz, Goldschmidt, Windridge, Betts, Groskinski, Lovisolo, Benassi, Bjornberg, and Froelich. So let me start by discussing some of the loop models at, at the origins of these loop models. So let's go back to, to 1925 and the description of Bose Einstein condensation by, by Einstein. And and this was a description which worked for non-interacting systems only. So for, for many years, there was a question, I mean, first, whether it was physical or not, but this was understood by Fritz London, that there was something physical about it, namely superfluidity. And then the question was how to describe it for interacting systems. And this is where Feynman introduced a representation in 1953, which can be called now the Feynman Katz representation. Uh, let, let me describe it a little bit. So, so the Hamiltonian for n bosons is over here. It's a sum of Laplacians for the kinetic energy of each particles and a sum of pair interactions. And one can expand the, the trace of exponential minus beta h in terms of Brownian bridges. So, so here you have a, a picture. So this is... Um, supposed to represent the, the space over here, so two dimensions, it's simple to represent. And we integrate over the positions of the particles and we sum all the permutations of these um, points and integrate over Brownian bridges. And everything is weighted in a complicated way according to interactions. So in any case, this is a probability measure on those uh, paths or, or loops. And the, um, the suggestion of Feynman is that both ancient condensation corresponds to the occurrence of long loops. And one nice thing about this is that it works for non-interacting or for interacting systems. So a few years later, the concept of off-diagonal Langridge order was proposed by Penrose and Onzager, which is understood now as the correct order parameter for both ancient condensation. But still, this picture of Feynman is actually very attractive and it's tempting to, to try to, to understand better what happens to, to those loops. And indeed, whether there, there is a transition to long loops and to understand better the, the nature of these loops. So there, there, was, there were simplified models proposed shortly afterwards by Kikuchi in 1954. And, um, and we can call this lattice permutations. So here we have um, the, the lattice. It's a subset of Z2. When he's interested in Z3, but um, it's easier to depict in Z2. So we have all those vertices. And uh, the main objects are the permutations. So let's call them sigma, which is a bijection from the lambda L to lambda L. So from the box to, to itself. So each point is mapped to another point. So when there is nothing, it means that the, um, the point is mapped on itself. And then we look at the sorry, at the probability on those permutations given over here. And the probability of the given permutations is proportional to, to this over here. So there is this parameter one over beta, it turns out to be one over beta and not beta. And then we take the sum over all sides and the, the square of the distance traveled by these sites. So this comes from the, from the Brownian bridge, which is in Feynman-Katz. 
so so this is a quite an interesting system. The spatial na nature is very strong, and one can wonder about what are the typical permutations under this measure over here. So something to to be observed is that the, the most probable permutation is the identity permutation, since you have a weight one over here. Otherwise, you get a smaller weight. Also, if the, those distance, I mean, those jumps are too big, then you, you really lose a lot. So, so here you have something which can be viewed as like a typical uh, situations. So each site is mapped to, to a neighbor or to itself, but not to very far. And the question is whether one should expect the, the cycles, so those trajectories to, to, to be very long or not. And everything depends on this parameter, one of the beta. If uh, one of the beta is large, meaning, and that's like the temperature. So at high temperature, those jumps are strongly suppressed and we are close to, to the identity permutations. But as beta becomes large, so one of the beta becomes very small, you have a possibility to, to travel. I mean, each jump can, can select quite a few sites, and then there is perhaps a possibility of traveling a long distance. So is this uh, what happens? So we, we did uh, numerical simulations with Daniel Gondolfo and Jean Ruiz. And we found that indeed that there is a, a phase transition to macroscopic cycles, meaning that if beta is large enough, so at low temperature, indeed those loops, uh, those cycles are, are very long. And the length of the cycle divided by the total volume is of order one. So macroscopic means that the length of the cycle is proportional to the volume. So this was. Um, the first observation. Second observation, numeric observation, is that there are many long cycles. So it's not like a random cluster where you have a single large component when this happens, but you have many of them. And, and then we, 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 there was this observation, numerical observation, which puzzled us. So, so we calculated numerically this thing over here. So we take the expectation of the largest length of all cycles, and we divide by all the long cycles, the, the length of the long cycles. And this, we got this number 0 0.624. And this number turns out to be also the, um, the number that you find in uh, uniform permutations. So if you take a permutation of n elements and you choose the permutation uniformly, you can look at the um, the length of the largest cycle divided by n, and you can average over these things, and then you get exactly this number 0 0.624. So it felt like, in a sense, what we had are permutations which are a bit like uniform, but at the same time, they are not because we have this weight over here, which means that um, the jumps cannot be very, very long. So, so those permutations here are very far from uniform. I mean, uniform means that any point can be mapped. To, to any other site uniformly. And we are definitely not in this situation. Still, if we look at this expectation over here, we got the same value as in uniform permutation. See, that's the, the way we, we, we was understanding, the, I mean, seeing it uh, then. So what's happening? And well, for this, there were very useful discussions with Nathanael Berestiki, Alan Harmon, James Martin, I mean, talented probabilist and we and it turns out that the, the heuristics could be understood in another model of loops called the random interchange model so it's a model i mean we, we are going to, to kind of see it as a representation for quantum spins just for for now it's under, it's enough to understand that you can take a product of random transpositions and you you build the permutation out of that and, and you can look at the cycles so on the complete graph, things were understood rigorously by Schramm, building on the, on the conjecture and actually a full heuristics by Alders. And what the Schramm managed to prove is that uh, the, the, um, the distribution, the joint distributions of cycles is given by Poisson de Richelieu. 
So Poisson de Richelieu is really the, um, the thing which is indeed a characterization of those long loops and also that also the distribution which happens for the distribution of cycles in uniform permutations. And if you, I mean, I'm going to explain more Poisson de Richelieu. So it's a measure on, on partitions. And if you average the largest partition element with Poisson de Richelieu, then you get this 0 0.624, which is what we observed before. So what we, we had was indeed a strong indication that the distribution of long loops or long cycles in our lattice permutation was Poisson de Richelieu. So let me describe what I plan to, to discuss today. So I'd like to, to introduce the Poisson de Richelieu family of distributions on partitions. Then I'll explain the Poisson de Richelieu conjecture for many loop models in, in dimensions three and higher. I will explain the, the heuristics, which is based on the split merge process. I mean, it's, it is both useful to understand why Poisson de Richelieu is present. And also Poisson de Richelieu, as we will see, depends on the parameter. And these heuristics actually allows to calculate the, the corresponding Poisson de Richelieu parameter. I will review a little bit of literature where the, um, this conjecture has been verified, mainly most of them on numerical results. And then I will discuss an application to, to symmetry breaking in quantum spin systems to understand the, the nature of extremal states of symmetry breaking. So by, by the way, if there's, a, if there's any questions, please do not hesitate to interrupt and ask questions. So, Poisson de Richelieu family of distributions. Just to, to review a little bit um, the literature. So it was introduced by Kingman in 1975, and it's been studied a lot in the context of mathematical biology. So especially by, by Ewens. I mean, it, it, it turns out to be a very important distribution there. But in fact, it's, it's been extremely common. So it shows up in Bayesian statistics, combinatorics, number theory, Statistical mechanics also by Derrida and Spohn, who were looking at the, the random energy model, and it turns out to be relevant there. Uh, let's say probability theory, but in many contexts, but including in the context of loop systems. And um, even the record statistics for the distribution of times of records and many others. So it's something which is um, actually really important in probability theory. So let me describe it mathematically. There, there are different ways to, to understand it and to introduce it mathematically. The, the simplest is using the stick breaking construction through the so-called griffiths engen maklowski distribution, the gem distribution. So, uh, so here you have interval zero to one. We are looking at partitions of zero one. So at vectors of numbers, all those numbers are um, are positive, they are ordered from the largest to the smallest, and they add up to, to one. So this is a partition of the interval zero one. And the, and the, so the, the way to define the, those numbers using the stick breaking construction is that you first select a number uniformly in zero one at random. So let's say this one, and this, uh, you decide that it's uh, x1. Now, in, in the interval which remains, you select uniformly at random. So for instance, perhaps here, we select the second number. And then we decide that this is x2. Then uniformly at random in what remains, this could be x3. Then uniformly at random, perhaps here, x4. And you continue. So with probability one, there's always something, some space remaining, and you can continue this uh, forever. So, so here you get a, a bunch of numbers, and they are all positive. They all add up to one by construction, almost surely. They are not exactly ordered. As you see, I mean, x1 is not larger than x2 over here. But if you reorder those numbers from the largest to the smallest, well, you get the random vector, which is Poisson de Richelieu. 
So this is the so-called stick breaking construction or residual allocation model. And when you start with the, the, um, the distribution, the uniform distribution, I mean, uniform random variable on zero one, and you do this thing, you get Poisson de Richelieu of parameter one. But it, um, yes, so, so let me also describe a, a completely equivalent uh, system, I mean, completely equivalent way of defining things, which is exactly the, the same, in fact. So here, let's look at the sequence of uh, random numbers. They are so called IID uniform random variables. So all of those y's are uniform random variables between zero and one, and they are all independent. Once you have the whole list of y's, you can look at this vector over here. So the first element you take y1, the second element you take uh, y2 times one minus y1. So what does it mean? So if y1 is over here, say, then y2 is something between zero and one, but now we multiply by one minus y1, which is uh, this, uh, space over here. So we reduce it a little bit. And so indeed, uh, one can check that this distance over here is going to be something like one minus y1 times y2. And then if you continue and you want to understand, I mean, this uh, uniform random variable between in this interval over here, you can also understand it as a uniform random variable between zero and one and which has to be multiplied by this distance over here. And this distance is this thing over here, one minus y1, one minus y2. So if you look at this vector over here, you get exactly the same thing as we as this residual allocation or stick breaking construction. So you get this so-called gem of parameter one. And if you rearrange this vector, random vector from the largest element to the smallest, you get Poisson de Richelieu. So this is a nice construction. It's quite easy, and it actually allows to some calculations. So so this gives the Poisson de Richelieu of parameter one. It turns out that this is a one-parameter family, and for more general, I mean for other Poisson de Richelieu distributions, the idea is that we instead of the uniform random variable, we should take this beta one theta random variable. So this is a, a random variable which take, takes values between zero and one. I mean, you have here the definition for in case you care. And, and then you can do exactly this construction over here. So you get the sequence of IID beta random variables. And you look at this vector over here. And this gives gem of parameter theta. And you rearrange from the largest to the smallest. And you get plus on the reached of parameter theta. So, this is well defined. Uh, I hope everybody agrees that um, that's something what we understand. So, so there, there is this Poisson de Richelieu distribution here. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Why, why is it called Poisson de Richelieu when it was discovered, as you mentioned, in the seventies? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, it, it refers to to a different way of defining it using. But, but um, now I don't remember exactly. I mean, there, there is some good reason why it's called Poisson de Richelieu, but it refers to a totally different uh, definition. So it generalizes some construction of points. Um, so, so there was something called the Richelieu process, and then it became sort of, became random with this uh, Poisson random variable, and this is Poisson de Richelieu. That's uh, so, so somehow at the origin. I wonder if anyone in the audience would actually <laughs> have a better answer to this question. Do not hesitate to, to say. But yes, it's not. Um, it was not proposed by Poisson and by Dirichlet. That's a fact. So the Poisson Dirichlet conjecture. So, so so let me discuss this. Discuss it. In the context of uh, these lattice permutations that we, we we saw before, so we we are looking at this random permutation, so bijection from lambda L to lambda L, 
Let's look at the, the length of the cycles. So L1 of sigma is the length of the largest cycle, L2 the length of the second largest cycle, and so on. And, and we look at this vector over here. So we take the largest cycle, divide by the number of, of sites, second largest cycles divided by the number of sites and so on. So we have positive numbers and they all add up to, to one. I mean, they're also in decreasing order. They all add up to one because if you sum all those lengths, then it's one way to count all the other sites you have. And that's, um, that gives the volume. So by construction, this is a, a partition of interval zero to one. And so the, the claim is that this random number always has this shape over here. So one should convince ourselves that then there's going to be a positive density of points, I mean, of sites which, um, which are in cycles of length one. So if you look at the smallest cycles, you have plenty of them and they should occupy indeed a, a non, um, I mean, a positive fraction of sites. So, so this part over here represents the, the tiny cycles. The cycles of order one, we divide by the volume. So in a system which is huge, those numbers are, are so, so, I mean, so, so close to one another, but it looks like, um, okay, but there, there's nothing. And on the other hand, we expect the, the largest to be of order one. So then on this part over here, up to, to some value, we expect the Poisson de Richelieu uh, distribution to be, to be relevant. So the, the precise conjecture is formulated uh, in these two parts here. So the first part of the conjecture says that there exists this parameter eta, that's the, the one over here, which you can understand in the following way. You, you look at the sum over the k first, uh, k largest uh, uh, partition element. So we, we take this, plus this, 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 I mean, uh, up to two over here. And we first let the, the system going to infinity. And this, we should get very close to eta provided k is large. So if we do um, the limit in, this, in these directions, then indeed we get that this, uh, this thing over here should be ex essentially equal to eta. So for all positive epsilon, if you take this, you get um, the probability of getting over here is, is goes to, to one. And it's very important to do the, the order of the limit like that, because if you take first the limit k to infinity over here, then this is necessarily equal to one. Then it cannot be in this, uh, in this part over here. So, so the idea is really to, to take first, I mean, to take a k large enough so that we are going to, to be very close to the accumulation point. We take the infinite volume limit and we can be arbitrarily close by taking k large enough. So this is this first part, namely that if we look at the mass of long, cycles or long loops, it's almost surely equal to some precise number. And the second part is that on this part, we have a Poisson de Richelieu distribution. So one form, one way to formulate the conjecture is that if we look at this random vector over here, but we truncate it to, to this k, so we look at uh, the first k, then this converges to in distribution to the um, to the first k elements of Poisson de Richelieu of parameter one. And in this interval zero to eta. So Poisson de Richelieu in a reduced interval, you just take Poisson de Richelieu on, on zero one and you multiply all elements by eta to, to scale them uh, a bit to, to something smaller. Can so this help? is the Poisson de Richelieu uh, conjecture. Yes. Uh, excuse me. So uh, how do you sample sigma in this situation? I probably I missed. But... So sorry, once so again. Sigma is a random. Sigma is a random permutation. Yes. Yeah. How how do you sample this sigma? Uh, By... Using the, the distribution, but for for lattice permutations. So, okay. Oh. Um, so which is over that here. has beta. Okay. So that, that's right. Yeah, so, yeah. so so beta, is, everything okay. depends on beta. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, thank you. That's actually a very good question. 
So things depend on beta, phu is eta. So, so this parameter eta depends on beta. The, the rest uh, does not. It, uh, excuse me, it also depends on the dimension. Which dimension? Uh, it you... depends on the dimension, yeah. So this is expected in dimension three and higher, not in dimension one and two. Um, yeah, thanks for pointing it out. So, and so for dimension three and given beta, we may or may not have a eta. But by the way, this eta could be zero. Well, that's the case where all the, the cycles are small. So for, for in high temperature, this eta is zero, but it is expected that there, there is a critical beta um, above which this eta becomes positive. And so eta depends on beta. And, uh, and then we have these properties over here. Then that's true for, I mean, okay. The dependence on beta is only through this eta. So this is the Poisson de Richter conjecture that in many models, we have this structure over here. But Daniel, I'm, I'm sorry. So didn't you say sure. that you did this numerical calculation for two dimension? No, I was showing pictures in two dimensions because it's easier. Oh, but, but you did the calculation three in three dimensions. Yes, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Right. So let me give you the, the heuristics and uh, thanks Hal for, um, for offering me a possibility again to, to point out that this picture is two dimensional, obviously, but it's just hard to, to depict it in three dimensions. But the, the heuristic applies to three dimensional systems and higher. So we are back to, to lattice permutations, same probability as before. So the idea is to introduce a stochastic process which has this uh, probability distribution as invariant measure. And we do it a little bit in the spirit of Monte Carlo simulations. So, so we propose a local change, which we accept with a certain probability. So the local change over here is that we select two neighbors and the neighbors are necessary. I mean, so, so this point, uh, I mean, one arrow comes in, one arrow comes out, same over here. And we propose to, to change things. So instead of going this, we, we do this. So this one goes over here and the other one, I mean, continues like that. So we go from one permutation to another permutation and we have to, to accept the, such a change with a certain probability. So in the standard Monte Carlo prescription, we, we look at the difference of energy. If, um, if the energy decreases, we accept the move. If the energy increases and we accept the move only with a certain probability, I mean, exponential minus beta times the difference. And, and then it's easy to, to check that uh, this probability measure satisfies the detailed balance and, and it's the unique invariant measure of this system. So, so no, um, I, I mean, everything is clear over here. <clears throat> but now let's uh, uh, try to understand what this gives uh, in terms of this vector of loop lengths or cycle lengths. So we look at the cycle lengths as before. So we have the largest cycle divided by the volume, second largest and smallest and, and, and so on. And we want to understand what happens when we do this change. So there can be two possibilities. If the two go from uh, this part back to, to the left. Sorry, where, sorry. Uh, Daniel, I think we didn't hear the last 10 seconds. Ah, sorry. Um, so when we propose a, a local change over here, what may happen is that we, I mean, we have two cycles over here, which can be merged into a single cycle here, or the opposite, which is, uh, I mean, if we start from here, we have a single cycle, we propose a local change and which results in two cycles. So in terms of this vector, uh, I mean, this partition over here, sometimes we take two 
partition elements and we merge them to together, or we can take also a given one and split it uh, in two parts. Now, there, there is uh, something which needs to be argued over there, but the probability of merging cycles i and j, well, somehow we take two points and we can look at the probability that this thing belongs to the cycle i, this thing to the cycle j. If we assume that there is a lot of independence, which is not so easy to, to argue on, then we get that the, this probability is proportional to two times the product of the length. At the same time, the probability that two points belong to the same cycle, but I mean, uh, one cycle and the other one, I mean, cycle again, but after having traveled quite a while, that this should be proportional to, to the length to the square. So if this is correct, if that's indeed the probabilities of merging or splitting the cycles, then we get uh, this effective split merge process where we go from this partition to another partition with probabilities of splitting and merging exactly like that. And in which case the, the invariant measure is Poisson de Richelieu. So the, the conjecture is that the, the loops somehow inter, I mean, interlace so well that the, the probabilities of merging and splitting is min field. So now I'd like to, to convince you that this is reasonable by looking at, uh, at this picture, which comes from simulations. So this is one cycle of uh, this um, lattice permutation model. So, so this one is really in three dimensions. So to understand this, so we have the underlying grid. So, and we have a cycle and we start with dark blue. And when we move along the cycle, so first of all, not all the points of the cycle are, are represented. So this is, uh, we skip a few points and then we mark another point. So we go from dark blue to lighter blue. I mean, light blue over here, then green, yellow, light red and dark red. And these are the, what we, we see. So what we see is that if we look at the dark blue, it's already all over. So if we look at the first five person, say, uh, of a cycle, of uh, this huge cycle, it has already spread around everywhere in the domain. The next five percent of a cycle, I mean, like from, uh, let's say, uh, the green part, if you try to distinguish green, green is everywhere, or light blue is everywhere, red is everywhere. So all those little fractions of, cy of cycles, of long cycles, are spread everywhere. So, so if we look at the, what happens when we have two such cycles, they are completely inside one another, they interact in all sorts of way. And if we look at the probability of selecting two sides such that uh, local change is going to, to result in, in merging the two, well, things average so well that it's rough, just proportional to the, to the length of the respective cycles and nothing else. I mean, this constant of pro proportionality is something difficult, but we don't need to, to worry. It only affects the, the time for these uh, simulations, but does not affect the invariant measure which is Poisson de Richelieu. So this is the, um, the heuristics behind it. And this explains why this min field split much process turns out to be relevant for, for this situation, which is genuinely spatial. So, so now what about evidence for, for Poisson de Richelieu? Well, there is one case where rigorous results can be, can be proposed, which is the idle Bose gas. And there was a structure understood by, by Schutter, which is basically that if you look at um, the idle Bose gas in the Fourier, Fourier space, you basically end up with uniform permutations and therefore what's on the original distribution. So this is something that we did with uh, Polkar Betts some time ago. And indeed, there has been also further results in this direction. So, so this is a case where things can be rigorized. At the same time, it has a very special structure. Then there are numerical results like for lattice permutations. 
and this, this things about checking the, that the effective split merge process we did with uh, Stefan Koskinski and Alex Lovisolo. There was a totally different study by Nahum, Choker, Sana Altuno, Somoza for some kind of, I mean, some O and loop model. So I'm not going to define exactly what it is. It's a completely different loop model, but they, they checked that indeed this Poisson de Richer structure is present. A loop model related to quantum spins that we did with um, in Warwick with three students, numerically also, and checking that the Poisson de Richer is there. And there are some partial rigorous results, but um, it's only partial. So with Costanza Benassi, my former grad student, we, we got something for another loop model related to, to classical spin systems. There's been also an interesting study by uh, Dima Yoffe and Balintot checking this Poisson de Rich, I mean, sorry, the split merge process, the heuristics, but it's also a partial result in the, in the, good dire in the right direction. So the conjecture is mainly open, I have to say. So finally, I'd like to discuss um, the notion of symmetry breaking in quantum spin systems. And this is uh, somewhere that we can understand uh, partly thanks to, to, this, uh, uh, to this relation with, uh, with uh, the loop models and this Poisson de Richer conjecture. So let me remind you of the setting for quantum spins. So we have a finite domain lambda in ZD. The Hilbert space is a tensor product of C2, at least for spin one half. It's a tensor product of C3 in case of spin one. These are the, the two cases I'd like to, to consider. We have a spin operators, which I'm using and denoting like that. So at every site X, we have operators S1, S2, S3, and they satisfy the usual commutation relations. So S1, S2 is IS3. S2, S2, commutator between S2 and S3 is IS1 and so on. And the, the two models I'd like to, to discuss is uh, first the, the Heisenberg ferromagnet over here. So we sum over nearest neighbors and we have the product of spin operators. So uh, I mean S1 at X, S1 at Y, and same over here. And for spin one systems, I will look at this kind of models, which is a linear combination of uh, this SXSY. So this SXSY means exactly this, uh, this sum over here. And we also look at this thing squared. So for those who are very, very used to, to spin one half systems, you probably have never seen something like that. But the reason is that for spin one half system, this is actually a linear combination of this thing and the identity. So, so it's totally superfluous to, to look at it. But for spin one systems, this uh, interaction is um, is distinct from from this. So Hilbert space Hamiltonians, and it occurred to me that I had to to introduce uh, Gibbs states, so I had to add them uh, later in the in the slides. So just to, to remind everybody, the partition function is the trace of exponential minus beta h. And the Gibbs state means that the expectation of an observable is the trace of the observable a times exponential minus beta h divided by the partition function. And we are looking at infinite volume Gibbs state. So, so we take the, the limit lambda goes to ZD, ZD by increasing domains and hoping that things converge. So, uh, so next, uh, the notion of symmetry breaking. So, so it turns out that there, there is a beautiful, very general theory, which has been established in, in great generality. The set of infinite volume Gibbs states is always a, a showcase simplex, meaning that uh, it's a convex set with a notion of, uh, uh, of elements of, which are extremal. And any Gibbs state, any element over there, can be written as a linear combination of extremal states. So A is the set of extremal Gibbs states, and any Gibbs state is indeed uh, given by an integral over a certain probability measure of those extremal Gibbs states. 
And so this is a probability measure. The mu over here depends on the state over here. So in high temperature, it's usually easy to establish that there is a single Gibbs state. So the set of external Gibbs states contains a single element. This one must be the same. And so this is just the, the direct, fun, direct measure on a given point. But, um, but I mean, it, there, there is this thing which is very curious. So on the one hand, this structure has been established in great generality, but then it's very difficult in concrete system to actually say, what is the, the set of extremal Gibbs states? Um, and, uh, and what are, I mean, what is the, the index set of extremal Gibbs states and what are actually the, um, the Gibbs states, the, the extremal Gibbs states? So let's discuss the Heisenberg four magnet. So, so what I'm going to, to explain is uh, natural and expected, but nobody has proved it. So we take the Heisenberg model, uh, spin one half. And what we expect, I mean, since we are describing uh, a magnet, um, that at low temperatures, we should have a magnetization pointing in some directions. So one way to define the external Gibbs states is like that. So we look at the finite volume Gibbs state with Hamiltonian H lambda. We add the magnetic field. So we have this H, and then we select the direction A, which is anywhere in in S2, I mean, a unit vector pointing in any direction. And so we have like a next total magnetic field in the direction A. So we encourage the, the, the spins to, or to the system to be magnetized in this direction. We first take the infinite volume limit here, and then we take the, the limit to where H goes to zero. So this should give us one of the external deep states at low temperatures and in absence of magnetic field. So one expects that all extremal Gibbs states, at least translation variant extremal Gibbs states, should be given by this construction. And then if you take the, the Gibbs state that you obtain with all symmetries, this should be an average over all these extremal Gibbs states. And this DA is just the, the uniform probability measure on S2. So we average over all possible directions. And, uh, and the expectation of an upper operator over here can be understood as, uh, as looking at the expectation of the operator in those external Gibbs states, and we average over all of them. So, so then there was a very nice suggestion by Tom Spencer which was to look at this kind of, some kind of Laplace transform on, uh, on the set of extremal Gibbs states. So this uh, Gibbs state is, um, is the symmetric Gibbs state. And we look at the expectation of the average of the exponential of this thing over here. So this is like the magnetization in, in direction three. We multiply by this, uh, real or complex number h and and what should it be so if we believe in these heuristics about symmetry breaking I, i'm a bit loose whether i'm discussing infinite volume gibbs states or finite volume gibbs states but everything can be we can put the, the limits in the right way so this is the symmetry gibbs state over here so we average over all those extremal gibbs states so we average of this operator over here then average of exponential turns out to be exponential of the average because the external Gibbs states are, I mean, satisfy some zero one law. So, so one should expect this, actually this might even be provable, this identity, but this one is uh, not proved. And, um, and then if one introduce, I, I hope you, you can see it, perhaps I should uh, enlarge this over here. We can introduce the spontaneous magnetization as this thing over here. So we look at the expectation of this S3 operator at the location zero in the extremal state where the magnetization points in E3. So we, we call this M star. And then one can check that this average over here gives us this function. I mean, you have M star and then it's a function of H, our voice. 
So assuming that, <coughs> that indeed the, the set of Gibbs, external Gibbs states is indexed by S2, then one can carry on this calculation, just assuming some symmetries. And we, we see that this thing over here should be this function over here. So what I'd like to, to do now is to, to redo the calculations, but using a loop model and using the Poisson Dirichet conjecture. So we can use a loop representation due to Balintot in 1993. There, there will be more to it, but here there, there is no need to understand the details of this um, representation. Suffice is to know that it exists. And, uh, and then it contains loops, and the loops are expected to, to be described with Poisson de Richelay of parameter two. So to understand this two, one needs to do the whole thing using this heuristic split merge process and check that it's actually two. Uh, within this loop model, we can introduce this, upper, uh, this object over here, which is a fraction of sites in long cycles. And then, if we look at this ex expectation of the exponential of this thing, this is equal to the average of the expectation in this random interchange model of a product over all cycles of this cush function here. So this part is actually rigorous. In finite domains, this is a, an identity, uh, this works. Now the cush function, the, 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 there is something which, um, which is important over here, which is that cosh x is like exponential of x squared for small x. And uh, it turns out to be important because here you have, I mean, some lengths of cycles are small and some are large. The small ones, so, so this is like of order one, so you get like one over the volume. You have a product over all such cycles. The number of short cycles is no more than the volume. So you'll get something like exponential of uh, the volume times one over the volume squared, which goes to, to one. So what I'd like to argue is that in this product of cycles, the small cycles of order one do not contribute in the infinite volume limit. And thanks to, to this, we can discard them. So what remains are the, the large ones. And for the large cycles, they are described by Poisson de Richelieu. At least that's the, the conjecture. So then as lambda goes to infinity, this is expected to be equal to, to this thing over here. So we take the expectation with Poisson de Richelieu, product over all elements, and the same uh, function over here, the h, and now we will have um, xi is the, the random variable associated with the i element of Poisson de Richelieu multiplied by eta because everything, I mean, the, 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 there is this mass, I mean, this fraction of sites in long loops, which matters, that's this eta. And this expectation with Poisson de Richelieu, this product of a cush, one can calculate this. I mean, it takes half a page. But then we get uh, this function over here. So that's the same function as before. And it's the same function of h as before, provided we, we, we assume, I mean, we are, accept this identity that the spontaneous magnetization as defined before is one half this eta, which is the fraction of uh, long cycles. So one sees that, uh, I mean, what I like to, to convince everybody here is that um, if we do this calculation using the loop representation, we get exactly the same heuristics as the one with symmetry breaking. So this completely confirms for um, the heuristics with symmetry breaking. So this was a model where things were kind of clear, the Heisenberg model, I mean, it's not proof, but it's uh, all these are supposed to be I mean, these are mathematical conjectures, so the, everything is exact. Only the proofs are lacking, but the calculations are always make sense. Finally, I'd like to discuss for the spin one model with quadratic and biquadratic interactions. So that's a model that we briefly saw before. So spin one, 
And for um, the Hamiltonian, is a linear combination of its uh, SXSY and SXSY squared with two parameters, J1 and J2. And uh, here you have a phase diagram for dimension three and higher. So here you have J1, here J2. By the way, this direction over here is the Heisenberg. Um, I mean, this is the Heisenberg model of spin one. This is the Heisenberg antiferromagnet of spin one. And what is expected is that you have a ferromagnetic region here, antiferromagnetic region over there. But then this phase over here is spin nematic. So for the intuition, I mean, it suggests that the spins should be either aligned or anti aligned. So, so classically, we expect a, a spin nematic phase, something like that, but uh, the spins would, uh, would try to align or anti align. So, so, so you break the direction invariance under the rotation. So, but I mean, you choose the directions, but not whether you go up or down. So, this is. Uh, supposed to be the spin nematic phase. So, and, and this is also where the, this loop models work, work. So that's why I'm going to discuss uh, this one. So if uh, this intuition, which is like the, the classical intuition is true, then how do you define a phase where the spins are somehow roughly pointing in one direction? So in the opposite direction is, is fine then you can do it uh, like that. So you take the, the Hamiltonian here, you add this thing over here, so H positive, you have this A times SX squared. So in order to, to lower the energy, you, you want this to be large, so that um, the, the, the spins should be typically along the direction A or opposite the direction A. And so you do the same construction as before. You take this thing, first the infinite volume limit, and then you remove this external thing. And that should describe the, the external state corresponding to A. And A belongs to the projective sphere, which is the, the sphere S2 where you identify the two opposite points. So A is identified with minus A. So if uh, the intuition is correct, then we have indeed that the, the symmetric deep state over here should be given by an integral over this projective sphere with a probability measure there of those extremal states. So is it true? Well, let's do the calculations. So we cannot use spin operators as before because the expectation of a spin operator since you can point in one direction or the opposite direction and it's the same. So the expectation would be zero. What is natural in this spin nematic system is this operator over here. So you take S3, you square it, and you subtract two thirds. So that if you have a single Gibbs state or a symmetric Gibbs state, the expectation of this is zero. And we can define the analog of a spontaneous magnetization, which is this, um, let's call it N star and like nematic. But the expectation of AX in the Gibbs state pointing in the direction E3. Then we can do the, the same calculation as before and averaging over PS2. So some tricks or, I mean, similar tricks as before and understanding the Gibbs states, I mean, this expectation when the Gibbs states is not E3, but the others. Eventually we get uh, this function of H. So as before, it's a function which depends on H and also involves this N star and nothing else. So is this uh, thing correct? Well, the idea now is to, to do the same calculation using the loop representation. So, so that's the loop representation due to Balinto, Tysonman, Nachtregale, and I at some point combined the, the two representations, which allows to, disc to describe this nematic phase. And so just to say a few words on this representation, here we have the lapis, here it's two dimensional. On each, on top of each edge, we have an interval from zero to, to beta. And, and we have uh, the occurrence 
have these double bars of the crosses. So the crosses are Balintot's representation, the double bars are Eisenman after Gale. And, um, and so the, one can check that the trace of exponential man is beta h, so the partition function of a quantum system is given by the integral of all, I mean, all occurrences of these crosses and double bars with this weight over here, which is free to the number of loops. The, the loops are defined in a, in a natural way. So you, you start somewhere, go up, go down, and do this. Uh, um, a cross means that you have to change. Here you use periodic boundary. And then eventually we, we close the, the loop. So, so in this uh, special case, there are two loops. One is denoted in blue and one in, in red. But what matters is that, again, we have a loop model. I, I don't want to, to describe this more. And we can define this important quantity, which is the fraction of sites in long loops. And the expectation of this operator over here, one can write it in terms of its loops as this expectation over here. So this part is rigorous. For finite domains, that's, that's uh, correct. So we average with this measure over here, this function over here, which is, okay, one third exponential minus two third, the h, the one over here. And then we have uh, the length of the loop divided by the volume and two third and this thing over here. Well, so now if we believe the Poisson Dirichlet conjecture, it turns out that um, the heuristics lead us to, to say that um, the cor corresponding parameter of Poisson Dirichlet is three half. So then this thing should be given by this expectation with Poisson Dirichlet, the same measure, but instead of this thing over here, we are replaced by eta times uh, the, the partition element from Poisson Dirichlet. So this is a Poisson de Richelieu conjecture that we have this identity. And then this can, can, can be calculated and a few lines of calculations and we get this function over here. So we can compare to what we had before. So I have just um, copied and pasted the, the previous result. So, so this thing over here, if we accept um, the, the, the heuristics of symmetry breaking, we get this function. If we accept the, the loop representation and the Poisson de Richelieu conjecture, we get this function over here. And it turns out that uh, this is indeed the same function of h provided n star is minus two third eta. So I have to, to thank John Michele for, for helping, <laughs> for making the calculations uh, explicit. Um, I relied on Mathematica as far as I was concerned. So if you have uh, this identity over here, everything works fine. But now there is uh, some problem because n star is by definition the expectation of this Ax in, in the Gibbs states with E3. And one can check that it's equal to one third of eta. So if one believes the, the root representation, this is what we actually get. So at the same time, we have this, uh, in order for, for this, I mean, for, for, for both conjectures, both heuristics to, to match, we need this. So, so then there was clearly something not working. And it turns out that the, those states like that are not the extremal states. So these are exactly what I explained before, where we encourage the, the states to somehow point in the, in the direction A or minus A and, and take the, the corresponding limits. What what are extremal states are this um, expectation prime or average prime. And the difference between this and this is that uh, instead of a minus here, we should put a plus. So instead of encouraging the, the system to, to have a, a magnetization, I mean, a, an expectation of all the spins in the direction A, actually here, because we have a spin one, we project onto the zero, uh, zero value of uh, the spin operator. And if we accept this, then it turns out that indeed uh, this works and we get the minus two sort of eta. 
and everything works fine. And one act can actually push this uh, further and check that, I mean, since walls are no longer extremal states, then in this uh, showcase simplex, they, they must be somewhere inside. And if they are inside, they can be written in terms of um, as the decomposition of the others. And indeed, we have um, this identity over here. I mean, it's it's heuristics. I don't have a proof of this. But both states defined over here are like an average over all vectors which are perpendicular of the correct extremal states. And I should point to that physicists, I mean, Friedman, Kosmachev, Clevitz, already understood this in infield systems. But, um, but okay, this is a situation where doing calculations with symmetry breaking, with loops, and reconciling them allows to actually understand really the nature of the symmetry breaking. So, so Daniel here, uh, yes, excuse me. So are you assuming that H is positive? Uh, it doesn't say in this equation, but. So here, oh yeah, I forgot to, I definitely expect uh, H plus here. Yeah, H it's very comes important. from, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So down yeah. arrow, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it um, doesn't matter, but uh, absolutely. So, so it was the limit h going to, to zero by positive values. Yeah. Thanks. So, so just to, to, to summarize, the notion of loop models are basically one dimensional objects living in RD or in ZD. And all the discussion that, I'm, uh, that concerned us today was for dimension three and higher. Dimension two is very interesting and there are lots of uh, progress made, uh, made nowadays, but it's a totally different uh, behavior. And so um, what I wanted to, to explain is that there is a universal behavior. In phases with long loops, the joint distribution of loop lengths is always a Poisson de Richelieu, Poisson de Richelieu with the, correspond the correct parameter. The heuristics is made on based on the split merge process. And this heuristics is very important because first it explains Poisson de Richelieu and second the Poisson de Richelieu depends on a parameter. And this is thanks to the heuristics that one can identify the correct uh, parameter. I did not explain this too much in this talk, but uh, I mean, we have Poisson de Richelieu parameter two somewhere, Poisson de Richelieu parameter three half. And it was really big thanks to a heuristics involving this. I mentioned some numerical results. Some, there are some results on the complete graph. And one application is to understand the nature of symmetry breaking. And on the complete graph, we have uh, some explicit calculations with Jakob Bjornberg and Jörg Frölich, which I did not have too much time to, to explain. Well, thank you very much for, for your patience. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this uh, very inspiring talk. Um, I now leave the floor to the audience for questions or comments. Actually, I think I have one uh, at least. Um, so, I mean, what, what, coming back to the Bose gas, I mean, what, what do we learn about uh, Bose Einstein condensation through these uh, conjectures? So, you, you could basically check that it's a U1 symmetry breaking. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, but this is already known. So I cannot say that we really learn something. It's more like, I mean, well, if you do numerical simulations, for, for instance, you could check that they are, the simulation are good by checking this distribution of loop plans, because we, this must be passed on the reach day, but uh, mm -hmm. the conjecture is very solid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, otherwise, I'm, not quite sure what would be the explicit consequences. But um, but otherwise, I mean, for instance, you could do the same kind of calculations also for the quantum XY model, which mm -hmm. is like hardcore bosons. Yeah. And you would check that um, the nature of the, the states are, I mean, A is not in S2, but in S1, because you would have, for the spin system, you would have magnetization in, in the plane. And this corresponds to a U1 symmetry breaking for, for the bosons. And so you could also do a similar cal calculations there. Yeah. And do you have, a, I mean, their eta, is it related to some physical quantity as, uh, as in the other applications? 
eventually, yes. I mean, so eta <coughs> is really something that you define with a loop system. And the loop system, the, the loop model has no direct physical meaning. But then it turns out that this eta is always related to, to an explicit uh, physically relevant order parameter. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Other comments uh, from the audience? Can I ask a question? So, <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Daniel. So it was very interesting. And, but I want to confirm the situation about two dimensions. So I think you said there's no phase transition in two dimension, but uh, is it true? Uh, no, no, no. no. I, I said that this is not relevant in two dimensions. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Although it turns out so, to be relevant for quantum systems in the ground state of two dimensions. Mm -hmm, but, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but in so two dimensions, this, uh, you have different physics. I mean, there is this costly stowless transition in some cases. Yes, yes. And uh -huh. there's all this amazing work on the Sham Lovner and uh, all this stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But this is just not uh, related to, to what I am uh, talking here. Yeah, but as for this simplest random permutation model, uh, does it undergo the standard transition that there appears macroscopic loop? So it's not clear. And oh. um, one should expect that the cycles are, are not macroscopic in two dimensions, but it's not clear whether mm -hmm. there is a transition or not. <coughs> Probably mm -hmm. some solid styleless transition should be there. Oh, uh -huh. that's confusing because uh, if you open. start from all. all means ON's classical spin system and you do the usual random loop representation, then you get this factor n to the number of loops, right? Yes. And in this uh, random permutation model, you don't. Oh, you have, you have factor two. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, in a sense we... So, yeah, 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 you do have, you have two orientations. That's right, yeah. On loop. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, that's something I should know. <laughs> so in a sense sure. we have that. So it corresponds to n equal to, yeah, yeah, okay. So that should belong to this KT class. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But it's a delicate okay. subject because for n equals mm. two, you expect because it's less and yes, for n yes, equals yes. three and a mm. higher, one oh, expects yeah. not. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. Very interesting, thank you. Other questions? Uh, may I have a question? Sure. Uh, so can, can one design a, a toy model, a statistical physics toy model where you have, where you get exactly this dish, Poisson uh, distribution uh, with, with any parameter I mean, some kind of mean field model or... Uh, well, so in the complete graph, the, the, one, can, one can obtain a result. So that's basically what uh, Schramm managed to, to do. So, so Schramm is really this uh, model that, um, that is described here, but on the complete graph and with only the other crosses. Then there has been more results. So for instance, still in the complete graph, but a mixture of uh, crosses and double bars, there are results by uh, Jakob Bjornberg, and I should uh, remember everybody. So there is uh, Potovsky, Miłosz, and Lise. And they have also proved that Poisson de Richelieu parameter one half is, is present there. But, but that's already a difficult thing to, to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the complete graph, and then, Otherwise, um, you have this idle balls gas, but the idle balls gas, I mean, starts with, I mean, you have these fine line cycles, but to, with, with no interactions. And you, you can rewrite everything in a different way so that you, you don't see the spatial structure anymore. And eventually one is led to, to uniform probability uh, permutations. So, I mean, yes, uniform permutations. Therefore, it's Poisson de Richelieu. With, so, para with what parameter? Parameter one. Yeah. What's on the rich level? Parameter one. It's uh, just uniform permutations with no no weights. So so these are the, the two cases which I'm aware of. Now it's interesting. I mean, the, yeah. Well, one should actually try to find situations which are. Uh, I mean, no longer the complete graph. 
but perhaps not as complicated as Z3. But but even on a complete uh, complete graph, as as you said, it's only the parameter one and one half, which. Uh, uh, no, so um, no? so for instance, the the parameter does not depend on the dimension. So so here we have parameter parameter three half, and this is expected also for for the system in, in the complete graph. And in fact, for um, with, with uh, Jakob and Jurg. We did the calculations like, for, for instance, for, um, this thing for, for the Heisenberg for a magnet on the complete graph. It turns out to be not hard at all. And, and this uh, can be rigorously proved. But this is a complete graph. So, so yes, in the complete graph, we get all these Poisson der Richelieu parameters. Um, I mean, basically, Integers and half integers always. Yeah, so so can one get any number, not not half half integer? Well, with within the loop models, yes, because um, so so where do I have my loop models? So here we have the three to the number of loops. If you, if you put an arbitrary parameter theta, then the corresponding Poisson de Richelieu is theta over two. So, so with the loop models, you can put something arbitrary here, an arbitrary positive number, and then you get always something. But now those models for which corresponds to, to something quantum, this parameter must be two, three, four, five, and so on. An integer, but not one. So, so, so for quantum spin systems, I'm, I'm not aware of anything else than an, a half integer parameter for Poisson de Richelieu. Thank you. Um, yeah, excuse me. So is this number three, is this a uh, factor three or two uh, related to spin, like 2s plus uh, Absolutely. One? So this oh. is 2s plus one. So uh -huh. it's also the, so the it's dimension, not... the dimension uh -huh. of the Hilbert space, as it turns out. So that, uh-huh. That's interesting. So you get this 2s plus one factor for these SU2 invariant Hamiltonians. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh. yeah. Yeah, so this is something which immediately occurs in, term, in the loop representation. Mm -hmm. So you, you can also have loop representations, I mean, certain for certain models, and you would have 2s plus one to, to the number of loops. Mm -hmm. So this can be made arbitrary large if you're interested in high spins. Yes, yes. So, uh, so in this case, this item not representation. You're working on like three plus one dimension, original space dimension plus this uh, beta direction, right? So yeah, that's right. That's, is, yeah. Uh -huh, okay. Is the situation same for this Bellington representation? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Other comments? Okay, doesn't seem to be the case. So thank you very much, Daniel, again, for your talk and for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much.